of her program on telephone operators, ladies who absolutely love your jobs. Okay, so it's great to see. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, so it's great to see so many people and some unfamiliar faces here this morning. Um, and as Bonnie mentioned, my name is Sue Mayberry, and my mother was a telephone operator. So I had this program pretty much all put together, and then when she asked me to do it the day before Valentine's Day, I added a Valentine touch to it. So this is kind of the story of my parents, how they got together, but you know, it has to do with telephone, so it seems like it fits. So I hope you enjoy it. The Valentine. This may have been the first Valentine that my mother received from my father. Handwritten, the message reads, to my darling wife, sweetest in the whole world, and signed, all my love, George. It began with an overseas phone call in August of 1948. Mazella Faye McNeil Marvin, my grandmother, mother of George, had died. An overseas call was placed to George, who was serving in the Navy. My mother was the operator that put the call through. She may have been the one to relay the news. I'm not really sure whether or not you know she told or someone on the other line. So now fast forward, fast forward to the dance, the summer of 1950. My mother went to a dance with her friend, Vera Cavan. And Vera's aunt was married to my dad's sister. And so she said, you've got to meet my aunt's cute little brother. He's just back from the service. And so my mom said, OK, you know, and Vera introduced him. And my dad was, I don't know if the word I want to use is myth, because he's kind of like, I don't need anybody to set me up, you know, with a date or a dance. I can do that on my own. But he, he went ahead and danced with, you know, with my mom anyway, you know, just to kind of satisfy Vera. And so my mom, when she was telling me this story, she thought, well, you know, that's going to be it. He really didn't want to dance with me. He just did it for Vera. But then there was another dance. And this time he did ask her to dance. And my dad loved going to dances. I found out that at his visitation, there was an old neighbor of his, and he said that dad had wanted to go to a dance, and it was in Baldwin. And dad lived in Spreadville. <coughs> The car wasn't available, his dad's car wasn't available, so he took the tractor in the winter <laughs> without a cab and drove from Sprankville to Baldwin to this dance, and he honked at his neighbors along the way. <laughs> the courtship lasted six weeks. The engagement lasted six weeks. Anne and George were married September 19, 1950, at the Little Brown Church in Nashua. Mom's maid of honor was her sister Betty Brown, and Dad's best friend was his cousin Don Nissen. After a quick honeymoon, they returned home to find Dad's papers waiting, because even though he had just served four years, he had signed up for the reserves. So he was sent to Japan shortly after they were married, and he was there for two years. And during that two years, George sent pictures to Anne. And Anne sent pictures to George. This picture was taken across the street from Bonnie Mitchell's house where Bonnie's parents used to live, and Bonnie lives now. Um, the house that's shown in this picture had at that time belonged to Donna and Vern Lang, and their daughter lives there now. And it's on Walnut Street. And this is right beside where uh, my mother had lived with her parents, George and Ella Brown. This photo was labeled, Thinking of My Darling, and I think that's her hope chest that you see in the background. Dad sent home many gifts to Mom, especially China. Bonnie remembers being there when Mom would open her gifts, 
since Bonnie lived across the street. One of the gifts was this painting. A Japanese artist had painted on the cloth this likeness of their wedding photo. Another gift was a kimono, the second honeymoon. When Dad returned from Japan, they took off for a really long honeymoon, and Dad wanted to introduce Mom to two of his brothers that lived farther away. One was Lloyd, lived in Lake Tahoe, and his brother Faye was living in Texas. But all of his other siblings at that time were around the area. So this was the same year that they opened up. It was Dairy Treat or Dairy Sweet. And so every time on the way on the trip, they would see one of those. Mom would say, stop and get me an ice cream cone. And so after like 10 or 12 times of doing this, my dad bought her like the biggest cone that he could get. <laughs> and that kind of, you know, then she kind of got sick of the ice cream for a while, I guess. <laughs> So my mother absolutely loved being a telephone operator. And she made so many friends with her coworkers. And she continued to get together with them at reunions almost up until the time of her death. I had thought that she had a reunion every year at her house, but I'm, it may not have been every year after talking with some of the other operators. But at least for like 50 years, they got together, 50 years or more, and enjoyed each other's company. So my mom, after that, she never really found a job that she liked other than selling Tupperware. So this is a picture of my mom taken in the late 40s or 50s. And of course, she liked to talk on the phone. The telephones and telephone service of the past. When you think of telephones, it's the inventor that comes to mind, Alexander Graham Bell. For decades, AT&T, known as Ma Bell, provided end-to-end -end telephone service. It owned the phone inside the home, the wiring inside the home, the nationwide complex of all the wires and cables and switches. It owned everything. So if you had a problem and your phone wasn't working, it didn't matter if the phone if it was a phone that was broken or the wire, the person that came could do it all. You know, he could fix your phone. If it was a phone, he could fix the wires. The first telephone exchange in Maquoketa was built by the Jackson County Bell Telephone Company in 1880 and was installed in the back of Dr. Martin's drugstore with Fortis Thompson in charge. He was also the manager for the American and United States Express companies. He owned and operated three drays, which took care of all the transfer business at the time. His wife, Cassie, was the first operator, and she took care of 13 subscribers the first year. And their switchboard may have looked something like this, only with you know three drays instead of the six that you see there. The second year, 1881, there were 31 subscribers, and a telephone sheet with the names and call numbers of the subscribers were printed. G.L. Johnson, was one of the first subscribers. And he had the number 13. And he was able to keep that as his office number until his death in 1918. The Jackson County Bell Telephone Company was the first licensee of the American Bell Telephone Company in Iowa to use the name of Bell as part of its corporate name. This company was incorporated in 1880 and received Iowa license number 17 from the National Bell Telephone Company. Several of the earlier licenses had not been used, so the officials believed that not more than a half a dozen Iowa communities had telephone service before Maquoketa did. In 1883, the Jackson County company consolidated with others, forming the Iowa Union Telephone and Telegraph firm. That same year, the Sentinel announced, Maquoketa is now connected to the outside world by telephone. In 1913, the federal government challenged the Bell System growing monopoly, and so that did get broke up a bit. And in 1984, the Bell system ceased to exist. 
there was literature to educate customers on how to dial long distance. This one reads, how to be an expert at direct distance dialing. Here's all you have to do. Dial one, dial the area code, dial the number you wish to receive, which to reach. And then if you should get the wrong number, I kind of remember having to do this. Ask the person who answers for the name of the city you have reached. Hang up and then call your operator immediately. Otherwise you'd get charged for that call. Does anybody remember doing that, having a call? Because it was expensive. I mean, I can't remember, but maybe that was, could cost a dollar or two. I don't know. And at that time, a dollar or two was worth more than it is now. And then there was the universal information. I mean, we all had that memorized, right? 555-1212. Some of the slogans you may remember from years ago, we were just thinking of you. Does anybody remember that one? We were just thinking of you. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice. <laughs> Reach out, reach out and touch someone. The telephone in wartime, it was important that people did not tie up the lines at peak times when the servicemen would be calling home. The 1940s ad talks about how the, the servicemen just had a few short hours and that the circuits were likely to be crowded at that time. And it helps a lot if you give seven to 10 to the servicemen. 1942, the pressures of war and war's work is on, especially on our toll lines. Let's give vital war, war calls the right of way and make equipment go as far as possible, saving copper and other materials for the war. 1946, it's good to be back with the telephone company after serving in the war. At the nation's call, the country's telephone server is one of the greatest in the time of emergency. Every telephone is a weapon for our defense. And then this shows talking about um, this woman is basically refurbishing telephones so that critically needed defense materials could be conserved. <coughs> Remember stands like this? You had to have a place to put your telephone. The first use of long distance telephone out in the Coconut was on February 3rd, 1898. And there were out of town telephone officials. This was like a really important event. They had music, they had 40 receivers connected. And then citizens were allowed to make some phone calls. Will Kundal, he called someone in Chicago. H.E. Griffin called Fred Chapin in Minneapolis. Dr. Luce called Dr. Ertelet in Pennsylvania. And Mr. and Mrs. Spencer talked to their daughter who lived in Cleveland. O.W. Joyner ordered a carload of cement by conversing with the Louisville, Kentucky Cement Company. A period common to many communities began in 1900, competition by two telephone systems. The Maquoketa Home Telephone Company was formed by Otto Wettstein, although he soon passed ownership to the St. Paul Land Corporation. And then they started having advertisements, like if you had both phones, you would put that in your ad. And I have a, an example of that. The Academy of Music, if you look down at the bottom, it says both phones. So it didn't matter which one you were subscribing to, you'd be able to call them. So I wonder then if they had like double the bill by providing that. This confusion ended in 1913 when the home company sold its property to Bell and the telephone headquarters was moved to 110 West Platte Street, which is across the street from where Nissen and Cabin is now, but that's a different um, number than than what that building is listed as. So that switchboard served the community for nearly 39 years. In 1915, 
There were 948 telephones in the city and 323 in the rural. And they talked about how as the farm economy was good, you'd have more subscribers. Farm were experiencing a bad year, then that number would lower. In 1940, there were 951 telephones in the city. Eight years later, 1,700. And by 1953, there were 2,300 in the city. It talked about that even though they kept making frequent additions, um, demand would still always exceed supply. So there was always a waiting list. If you wanted a telephone, you still had to be on a waiting list to get that put in your home. So this I just recently got, Bonnie sent to me, I think it was last week, and Connie Southers Partridge had sent these pictures. Grace Shocker Scott was a telephone operator before she married in 1922. She was about 18 years old when she became a telephone operator. She was born in 1898, the daughter of August and Cora Shocker, and she lived on North Otto Street across from the park with her sisters Beulah and Fern. Fern played piano for the silent movies that came to town. Grace and her sister Beulah married brothers, Lester and Ernest Scott. So this picture is when some of the telephone girls were in some kind of a program. And Grace is in the bottom, in the center. 1922 article, Miss Grace Shocker who has been an employee at the telephone office for six years, was the honored guest of the Northwestern Bell Telephone Company employees this evening at six o'clock dinner in the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> the room was prettily decorated with hearts and crepe paper. Games and music from the Edison, which were generously donated for the occasion by Snow White Pharmacy, were among the pleasures of the evening. Miss Shocker will be a March bride. Now I talked to Norma Mata and she assures me there's no way the restroom was big enough for that party. <laughs> Must have been the break room, which they also call the restroom. <laughs> Photos shown of Grace and her co-workers when she worked at the telephone office above the bank. Then Carson's drug on the northwest corner. Grace is in the center in the front row. She has a ribbon on her lap which may have been from the party held in the restroom. <laughs> and they're all, you can see they're all dressed up. And then Connie Partridge had submitted these photos. And Grace is her grandmother. This one was in our Way Back One column. Miss Hattie Miller, one of the oldest operators. This is kind of an amazing story. Talk about dedication to your job. In 1925, Miss Hattie Miller, for many years, night operator at the telephone office received special recognition from official of the company for her courage in the morning of November 20th, 1925, when the building which housed the telephone office burned. Receiving the call, the alarm at 4.15, Miss Miller called the fire company, the volunteer fire company, the owner of the building, the telephone employees, and in spite of the smoke which filled the room, she remained at her post. <laughs> and she handled a large number of calls. Not until the floor of the grocery store below gave way was Miss Miller assisted by the firemen down the ladder to safety. <laughs> Can you believe that? <clears throat> the telephone operators were unionized through CWA. Sandra Kinraid's dad, Ir is it Irwin or Irvin? <coughs> Irwin Cassidy was the repairman. George Kloppenberg was the supervisor. And George was the father of Mary Jo Stead. And Mary Jo and her husband were the donors of the Stead Children's Hospital at the University of Iowa. 1949 Act, 800,000 people own the Bell telephone business. So I think you had to work there, maybe to be able to buy these certificates or bonds, whatever they were called. So this one was made to mature in 1979, so I just wonder, 
you know, how long a life that one had. And at an interest rate of six and a quarter. This one was going to mature in 2009. So I'm just wondering, you know, what happened with all of those then? Did they just become worthless pieces of paper or? Worthless. They were worthless. In designing the new equipment, officials studied local telephone habits. Surveys showed that Maquoketans are apparently more sociable than <laughs> residents in many other cities. It was noted that the average telephone conversation here extends 207 seconds, considerably higher than any of the other places. An average of 1,000 calls an hour were made during the peak periods of the day. So, more equipment was going to be needed. Toll calls had also increased. The daily average of 340 in 1943 had jumped to 615 just five years later, and then to 805 in 1953. While the automatic equipment had superseded the number please girl for local calls, McCoquitin still needed the assistance of the voice with a smile. And I'm thinking my mother probably helped drive that average up. <laughs> All the talking she did. So I found out last week from meeting with Norma Modit that local training was done at the local telephone office, but the long distance training for some of the girls, um, and I just talked to someone today, and she did not travel out of town, so it wasn't for everyone, but and I think Norma said it took six weeks, and she trained in Iowa City. She would take the Greyhound bus, which would pick her up at the Decker House. Her mother would walk her there to the Decker House. She was 17 years old at the time, and she said the bus said Los Angeles on the side. Then she would come home on the weekends. She stayed at the chief operator's house, and her name was Hattie Goody, and so she was related to the Goodies here from Maconkada. Now Norma's sister, Mary Cahill Cook, she took the train um, from Delmer to Iowa City. And so her dad would take her to the train station. And then I understand that Mary Jo Reaganweather Crouch was trained at Vinton. Not sure how she got there. How did you get there? My boyfriend had pictures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was, yeah, that would be a long drive for then. And then when the training was completed, the shift that the operators took on was the one to 10 shift. And they were required to work a Sunday or two and alternate holidays. The phone bill. So I'm thinking that some of, you know, I, I just remember our phone bills being kind of high, you know, the long distance calling and stuff. And it's talking about in this ad, that when you look at your bill, be sure to count the calls you get as well. Often it means the bill covers about twice as much as you pay for, you know, unless you accept it, collect. So they're trying to tell you, like, we're not overcharging. Look what you're getting, you know. You're only paying for half the call. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then, of course, there were bargain rates, times of the day that you call that it would be more economical. And then Norma explained to me that the telephone operators, every time somebody made a long distance call, they had to manually tabulate the cost of that call. You know, like how many seconds they were on. And then at the end of the night, they had to add them all up. And everything, just like it would be working at the bank, it had to balance or whatever, it had to come out right. So. The new exchange building. January 15, 1954, marked an important milestone in Maquoketa telephone history. They dedicated that building on the corner of Quarry and Olive Streets, which is now owned by CenturyLink. And the Jackson Sentinel, um, they kind of kept the public updated along the way, and then even published instructions concerning the use of the dials. There was an open house that was held. And at this building, Norma had said that the night operator, there would just only be one, just by herself in that building. R.F. Zink was the manager. 
This $600,000 expansion project had begun nearly two years before. It included the new building, construction of new cables and lines, and additional of dials to some 1,900 telephones in the city. So this was a really big project. And installation of 400 phones, or of new phones for 400 <coughs> rural customers. Representatives of the city, civic groups, city officials, and telephone company dignitaries attended. And the first call was dialed by Ben Jacobson. I've got two photos of him. You know, he was probably somewhere in between those two ages when he made that call. He, for those of you that don't know, he was owner of Ringlet, Ringlet Hardware, and he was the oldest active fireman in the state of Iowa, perhaps in the United States. He had served as a member of the fire department for 70 years. Then history repeated itself when Robert T. Melville, who was the publisher of McCoketty Newspapers, placed the first long-distance call to Fred Woodward, Dubuque Telegraph Herald publisher. This had been arranged by Robert Sink because the first long-distance call from Maquoketa, made in, 19, in 1883, connected W.C. Swigger of the Sentinel and the publisher of the Dubuque Herald. This was not only the first long-distance call on the new system, but the first time that a Makokota operator had dialed directly a number in another city. Now operators could direct dial to Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, and Rockford. The actual change to the dial service occurred a few minutes before midnight. At her post in the company's upstairs rented quarters, Miss, Mrs. Glatha Sellers, veteran night operator, made history as she placed the last call from the manually operated switchboard and transferred the service to Mrs. Margaret Ann Ale, chief operator at the new building. So when my mother worked in this old building, I don't know if she worked at the new building, but she talked about how hot it used to get up there, and one day they all stripped down to their slips only to have a male supervisor show up. <laughs> Maquoketa Community Press, December 16, 1958. Mrs. Glatha Sellers observed her 30th year with the company and they had a dinner event for her and she was given or gifts and so on. And then I thought about Glatha. I didn't know before that she was an operator, but she lived across the street from me when I was growing up. And I just remember she never seemed to be outside. Well, she was probably sleeping. But she was this petite little woman. She walked fast and she talked fast. She had two little dogs that barked all the time. Probably she put them outside when she's sleeping. I don't know. So Glatha, Norma tells me, loved working at night because her husband was an on-the-road salesman. Um, she did not have any children, any living children. And so she worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. all alone. The weeknights were shared with other operators. So I guess you just had one night operator then at the old building as well as the new building? Or just one. Just one. <coughs> Margaret Ann Luckyish Ale's obituary. That's another thing. These, the women loved working at the telephone office so much, and so their family knew that. And almost everybody's obituary talks about how much they enjoyed going to the reunions and that they had worked at the Northwestern Bell. Even if it had been a few years, and then their next job, they worked for 40 years, they still would talk about that. So Margaret had worked for 33 years for the company and retired in 1979, and she had been my mother's supervisor, as well as possibly your supervisor, too. <coughs> An earlier photo of the building on Main and Platte, built in 1876, it originally housed the Harris Opera House. And the newspaper offices were down below. Another photo, and notice the people looking out the window. So would there have been operators at that time? 
up there? Would those be operators, or is that too early? I don't know. Do you remember waiting for the dial tone? In a matter of days, McCoquitans became acquainted with waiting for the dial tone. Six months later, few will admit that they miss the operator's pleasant number, please, which had sounded over local lines for nearly 74 years. October 1961, these were among present past phone operators at an event here. There were 77 operators at this reunion held October 26, and it was at the Tango Supper Club, which you know that building is no longer standing. I think just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through and read these, but because you'll see singles pictures of these ladies later. But this is, there were so many that there's two separate photos here. In the 1998 telephone operator reunion was held at my mom's house on West Summit Street. These were the 1998 attendees. And I'm looking here, so we have, um, let's see. So Norma, who's in the audience right now, was at this reunion. And, any, were you at that one, Mary Jo? I don't see your name. Good health to everyone was written on cloth hankies with each operator signing their name. Betty Glee Brown Comet, which was my mom's sister, was born in Maquoketa in 1932. She worked at Northwestern Bell and later Clinton Engines here in Maquoketa, and then later she worked um, Clinton Engines in Michigan. Darlene Flanker Cook was an operator. I don't know, is she in the audience today? No. And she does volunteer here at the museum. I do see her here sometimes. Um, she and her husband operated Kellams and Birch for many years, which her son now operates. Mary Cahill Cook, sister of Norma <coughs> Moddett, was born in 1931. She was born in Otter Creek and graduated from Maquoketa High School in 19. 1948 and of course worked as a telephone operator. She married Kenneth Cook in 1953. Marilyn Allison Franzen, and she couldn't be here today, she had an appointment, but she lives in the Maquoketa area with um, many family members nearby, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Jean M. Waters, was educated in the Fulton Independent One Room Schoolhouse and graduated from MHS in 1947. She was married to Paul and was the mother of Dennis. And then later she worked several different jobs and then her last job, which she kept for 30 years, she was the deputy assessor for Jackson County. Madonna Rose Hughes Fegan was born in Iowa City, and she's, Madonna is still living north, north of town. She graduated from Miles and was married to George. Norma Cahill Schintaler Modet. She left Northwestern Bell to be with her husband, who was stationed in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she, she loved it there, loved working there at the switchboard. And her husband, Stu, was in the Air Force. And then her son, Phil, was born in 56. And in 57, they returned to Maquoketa. And then the next year, she went back to work at the Clinton Engine Switchboard. And you stayed there until 1959. And Stu and Norma were the owner-operators of Stu's Dry Cleaning for many years. Anna Mae Regan. Reagan Weather Jackson, sister of Mary Jo Crouch, was born in 1929. She graduated in 1947, and two years later was married to Don Jackson.
Frances Charlene Crouch Regenweather was the sister-in-law. So you had, a, you know, with the telephone operators, you had a lot of relatives. You know, they were just a close group. She was a sister-in-law to Mary Jo Crouch and Anna Mae Jackson, so both two were sisters. Her husband, Francis, was employed at Clinton Engines. He went by the name of Mike. And he had graduated from Macomb in 1950. They later moved to Washington, D.C. Um, when Mike became employed with Coca-Cola. But then later they relocated to Dubuque. Joanne Scott was from Baldwin. And I'm trying to figure out if, if she was the one who married a Bullock. Does anyone know, recognize that name? Geraldine Smith Studding was the daughter of Milo and Clarabelle Smith. She graduated in 1848 at the age of 16. Now I was surprised there were different ones that graduated at 16. So could you just like skip ahead? Or if you got all your classes done? Started early. You, you, or you just started early. Okay. I kind of wondered on that. And so then right after that she trained to be a telephone operator. She was married to Russell Studding. And um, she had various jobs, and then she also was a bookkeeper for their business, the Marketplace Furniture Store. Lillian Clark Thompson graduated the same class that my mom did. She was very active in school. And is she still living? No? <coughs> Maxine Alice Shirk von Sprecken was born in Monmouth in 1929, and she graduated from Onslow High School in 1947, was married to Robert, and she was employed with Northwestern Bell for over three years. And she and her husband had farmed um, or managed several farms during their 56-year marriage. Born in 1928 in Otter Creek, Mary LaVon Ryan died in 2019. She graduated with class of 1946, and she was Carl Ryan's sister. He was the barber here for many years. She was married in 1950, and she was an assistant operator. So she would have been one of the operators that would have trained the newer operators on the local calls. Marcella Cahill which is Norma's sister-in-law. So Marcella married um, Tom Cahill, which is Norma's brother. And then Marcella happened to be my mom's first cousin. So she graduated from Maquoketa High School. And there she excelled in mathematics and competitive roller skating. <laughs> yeah. So they ended up, um, I thought I had this written down on the slide, and I guess I don't. But they moved to Phoenix. So they lived a number of years in Phoenix and were involved in like managing um, a grocery convenience type store, which uh, was owned by her brother, by her brother. 2009 Telephone Operator Reunion. Again, my mom hosted this one. This time it was at her house on Rosemary Lane. And these were the attendees. Again, the operators signed these hankies. I was afraid to iron mine. You know, I thought maybe they would, or if I washed it, I didn't know if the writing would stay on there. But my mom kept that, you know, all those, all those years. And Norma still has hers. And you still, and you brought yours. Okay. Norma Brown Clark which is my mom's first cousin. Again, all these connections with people. She was born in 1921 in Emmeline. She grew up in Monmouth and graduated there in 1948. She, after working at Clinton Engines, she and her husband had farmed in, I think they would have been like in the Baldwin, west of town there area. Dolores Tracy DeLarm married Richard in 1957. She was the daughter of Clifford and Esther Tracy. And is that a relation of yours, Anna? Okay, cousin. Arlene Edna Grosskruger Engel was born in 1934, and she grew up in Preston and graduated from there in 1953. 
She was married to J.C. Engel, and they farmed, and during that time she took care of the bookkeeping duties with the farm. Lorraine Pohl married Larry Gilmore in 1959. She was a graduate of Andrew High School. Frances, Fran Spain, was the wife of Dwayne Spain and a 1961 MHS graduate. And in her obituary, it mentioned she really enjoyed the monthly luncheons with former telephone operators for 14 years. <laughs> Meredith Maisel Hobson Swanton was born in 1938 in Iowa City. She graduated from Maquoketa High School in 1956 as valedictorian. After high school, she worked as a telephone operator. Um, she married Maurice Kenneth Swanton in Maquoketa. So this one I came across, and I had to put that in there. Well, Meredith did not win. Do you remember when they used to have things where you had to sign? I know you had to do that at one of the grocery stores. So the ad says, sorry. Miss Meredith Hobson would have been the winner of $60 in train, but she failed to sign the register during the week. That's just what you want to hear. You know, you didn't win. <laughs> However, she gets a lovely pair of nylons as a consolation prize. <laughs> and then remember, don't fail to sign up this week, you know. Be sure to register every week. So raise your hand if you like real faithful about registering at these places every week. Did you do it? No. <laughs> Janice K. Wyrup was a 1955 graduate. She participated in plays and FHA. She was a sister of Dolores Dutton. She looks good in a headset too, is what it says on this matchbook cover. Now, the, by working at Northwestern Bell, even though some of them, you know, maybe only got to work there three years because of the training then that they received, they were able to get good jobs than other places, and such as, you know, working at Clinton Engines here. Madonna Ailes Bach. I really don't have any information on her. Does anyone want to share anything about her? Anybody know? The Bolte twins, Betty Sweetie and Bonnie Turner, and they were sisters of, help me out here, used to be at the museum all the time, their older sister, what was her name? Dorothy. Dorothy, Dorothy Kelcher. Okay. So Betty Sweeter took over for Norma in 1957 when Norma had left to be with her husband. Leota Lee Barr Fowler of wife of Dale Fowler was from Preston. She had worked in the accounting department at Clinton Engines, but she took over at the switchboard when the operators took their breaks. The Buddy Twins, Gloria Buddy McCutcheon Barr and Kathleen Joanne Buddy Irwin. And then there was Dottie Boyson Robinson, who was married to Donna Bollinger's brother. I don't have any other information. Nola Hoover Vermal. Nola Vermal Hoover. Okay, thank you. She took a transfer. So they were offered transfers, some of the women. And, you know, some just couldn't with children and so on, drive back and forth and, you know, be able to relocate. So where did, do you know where she transferred to? Uh, they've lived in Cedar Rapids ever since I was young. Okay. She was actually my godmother. And then, um, and my you're sister in law is too. <gasps> Marcella. Yeah. Marcella Vermal. Sister, oh, sister in law to Marcella Vermal. Oh, okay. Okay. And then Vera Jean Caver Cavan Everett. She's the one that introduced you, my mom and dad. And then Carolyn Dunn Clark Moorhead is with us here today. And her son in law, Dave Clark, he recently gave a brown bag talk about coins. Do you remember that? Maybe a month or so ago? June Cook, Raider, who is Alan Cook's sister, she was married to Virgil Raider, and he died this year at age 90 in Arizona. So I believe she 
She survived him, so. Lila Lorraine Harrington Coffin, sister to Judy Conrade, and I couldn't find where she's buried. I don't know where. In Delmer. In Delmer? Okay. And then I'm wondering here, I wrote Arlene Crouch. Was that Charlene? Did I just get that mixed up? Is there an Arlene Crouch that was an operator? No. No, but, I don't think she was. Okay. Charlene was. Charlene was, okay. Um, Betty Dodds, wife of Glenn Myatt and the mother of Pam Crawford and Lon Myatt was a 1944 graduate. Now this one I found kind of interesting. So somebody had this yearbook. For every woman that got married in there, she just crossed out the maiden name, just scratched it out. And put the married name, it's just like, nope, she didn't exist before then. So Mar Marge Eckelberg is a sister to Vivian Rowe and Eloise Rubel, and then she had other siblings as well. And, yeah. 1956 Andrew graduate, Mary Ann Folsang Herschelman, was married to Alan. And I believe they were farmers? Yes. The farmers? Yeah. And then there was Ray Galloway Hazen Miller, Darlene Simmons' sister, <coughs> Mary Henningsen, was the aunt of Don Henningsen, and she was an operator assistant at one time. And then Carol Johnson worked at the Clinton Engine switchboard, and she was here for a really long, you know, up until they closed. And I'm not sure if she still lives near like the she DeWitt lives area. DeWitt, doesn't she? Yeah, she, I know on the highway, you know, they took her house that time, so I didn't know where she moved after that. Mildred Lane, she moved here from Mason City, and she became an assistant chief officer. So you could kind of move up a little bit in the company of the different. Doris Lang Elkins was married to Leroy and the mother of James, and she lived on Summit Street most of her life on the corner Summit and I can't think of what street Niagara. that is. Niagara. And she and my mom were really, really good friends. But mom always said her name so fast, it was like Dorsan, Dorsan. Instead of Dorsan, it sounded like it was Dorsan. You know, so what a strange name when I was growing up. <laughs> Dorothy Lang was married to Burke Kendall. Was she related to Doris? Same last name or spelled differently? Mary Lewis had moved to Coralville. Her husband had done construction work for the telephone company, so maybe when that was done, you know, they moved. Lois Nelson Welch, the sister of Jerry Nelson, she was married to Don, and she was born in Don. <coughs> we have Mary Jo in the audience, Mary Jo Regenweather Crouch. And so her sister worked there, and her sister-in-law worked there. And you had other relatives, too? or? And let's see, you worked at Northwestern Bell until the new <coughs> office closed in either 63 or 64. Is that how long you worked there? I worked until it closed. Until it closed. Do you know what year? Do you remember what year that was? I think 63. Maybe 64. And Norma had trained. You had trained her for the local calls. Had you trained? No. No? No. Okay. So some of the women transferred, took transfers to Dubuque or Davenport, and there may have been other cities as well. Mona K. Regenweather Grip. I don't have any information. She lives in DeWitt. She's still living. Okay. And then Aveline Ailey, small aliener. She had lived on a farm with her husband. And they had a large family. Um, and she passed away a few years ago. Juanita Sager Stagg was born in Otter Creek. I don't have any other information on her. Fern Schnorr Schintaller still resides here in Maquoketa. And she and her husband Milo were the parents of three boys, I believe. Louise Beaton Miller. And Norma was explained to this, she worked as a cut over or a change over. Mm -hmm. So that summer when they were going to make the transition from the one building to the other. 
But in her obituary, it said she was an operator for three years. And then after she, her first marriage, she worked as an operator at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, during World War II for two years. Then she later married Howard Miller. Joanne Sue Speck, and she just recently passed, and in her obituary said she really enjoyed attending the old telephone company gang luncheons. She was a 1960 graduate. I could not find her picture, graduation picture. She was married to Floyd, Floyd Mickel. Beverly Jane Stickley Haylock, and that's Betty Miller's sister, was a 1953 graduate, and again, she graduated at age 16. Oh, and you did too. Wow. Okay. Marjorie May Wagner Fisher, she graduated from Elwood High School and married Ronald in 1949, and she and her husband had farmed in the Welton and DeWitt areas. Mildred Stuckel is the, was the aunt of Diane Sprague. Mm -hmm. And Fern Wentworth Gettler, Don Wentworth's aunt. And she worked with Northwestern Bell until 1958. She and her husband had four daughters. So these luncheons, I found out, were usually organized by my mom and by Mary Cook. And in the 80s, they met at the Tango. I guess I showed that picture. Other, But the luncheons that they had in recent years, before my mom died, and then even after, they'd either go to Welton or Maquoketa or Sprankville. And then when COVID hit, you quit doing the luncheons. And then Mary Jo, I understand you tried to get those going again, but it just, was, just didn't happen, right? Okay, so, sorry, so we have not a lot of time left, but I wanted to open this up to anybody that would want to come up and speak. I know Milt Cornelius has some interesting things. He was an operator that he'd like to share with us. And then if anybody else would like to come up, and if you don't want to come up, we can bring you the microphone too. And I know there's so many operators that obviously I've missed, but I would like to do another program at another time, maybe in a year, with adding some more things. All right, I was uh, kind of a part-time operator when I was in junior high. Uh, in Andrew, we had three full-time operators. My mom was one. The switchboard was in our house. So if mom was busy in the kitchen and I wasn't doing anything, go, go handle the switchboard. So, <laughs> so uh, the workings of it, you know, Call came in, you take the cord, plug it into the line, say number please, to tell you what line, or, or sometimes just tell you who they wanted, you had to know the number, take the other cord to match, the match, put it in that line, ring the, push the lever to, to ring it, when you hear them talking, then you flip the, the lever, the switches back to normal, and they could talk, but I couldn't hear them then, so. Uh, who, who remembers what they call a general ring? Anybody? General ring. See, Maquoketa was too big an exchange to do this, but in Andrew, if there was a community function, a uh, community function in town, Huh? Yeah, I guess I can't hear it over there. Hold it closer. Hold it closer. Okay. Um, if there was a community function, you know, maybe a church had a chicken supper or Saturday morning there'd be a bake sale in the post office lobby. We'd take five or six cords, plug them into a bunch of lines, give it eight, eight or ten real short rings, and everybody knew that was what was coming. You'd be listening. We'd hear, you'd hear receivers coming off hook. You'd make the announcement maybe twice sometimes, especially if you heard, if you're almost done and you still heard someone picking up, you'd say it again. And then you unplug those, put them six, five or six more lines, and do it again. It was free advertising. <laughs> okay, uh, a lot of times I, in the evenings, especially in the winter, uh, and mom would be in the kitchen, I'd be manning the thing. And at nine o'clock, 
it was basically shut off, but there was, you flip a switch and there was a loud buzzer in mom and dad's bedroom and somebody had a call, like, then that would wake them up. So a lot of times, nine o'clock or later, I'd plug in five or six lines, call Eldon and Leanna and Marilyn and John, <laughs> and flip the switches open and we'd all just sit and talk. <laughs> we'd have our own, own conference call. <laughs> so that was, that was that was my experiences. Uh, the long distance calls, uh, we had one long distance line to Bellevue, two to Makokota, and uh, you, you know we'd have, like she said, we'd have to make a note, a, a form, write out what the times of the call and everything like that, and then after. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, I think it was 63, uh, then uh, after we were dialed, then our, our, our uh, instead, uh, the call would, uh, when they quit having operators in Makokota, it automatically all went all the way to Davenport. So we didn't really see any difference. So, so anything else? Do you want to show that thing that you brought? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here I've got, you can come and look at it. It's not all, it's not all here, but this is a test set that uh, you put it on your, over your head like that, climb up the ladder to, to work on the lines for the old magneto boards. So, <laughs> I've still got that. <laughs> We lived on the party line, and uh, I don't know if anybody else was on the party line. And I can remember our ring was five shorts, that, and, the, and the phone was on the wall. Had a no, five five shorts is unusual. Um, um, she had mentioned uh, Marianne Hersherman, and, um, but uh, her uh, Alan's number, well, Alan's dad's number, his focus number was uh, three shorts. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, up to five was a short ring. Six, seven, eight was a long ring. So our number when we were on the farm was seven, so it was two long rings were ours. The neighbors was six, one, which is a long and a short. <laughs> that, was, that was the number code. And when you lived on a party line, that was your entertainment. <laughs> when, uh, if, if, I, if I called you, everybody else's phone, phone on that line rang also, so they knew was who was getting the call. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the, we had one customer that uh, uh, she was blind, uh, almost blind, but when we, <laughs> she, she liked to listen. When we put in the dial phones, then only that phone rang. She found out that she had a wall phone. She would hang a dish pan over the phone, and there'd be enough noise that vibrate that she could hear that vibration and she'd go listen. <laughs> uh, I, I, could, I could talk for a while, a lot of stories, but uh, I was more into the actual workings of it. So, an actual, you know, the operator. It was fun. <laughs> Mel, Mel, Barb has a comment. Yeah. I was just going to say there were five people on our party line. And people would always listen in. So my mother and her sister would talk German. Oh. <laughs> uh, in World War I, my grandmother was, was Carrie, Frank Cornelius' wife, Carrie, uh, and her mother never looked, uh, lived out in Andrew, and her mother never learned English. And it was illegal to speak German during World War I on the phone. So my grandmother got a hold of the governor, and she has a, she had, Somebody still got it, I believe. Still has a letter from the governor of Iowa that she could talk German on the phone to her mother. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I think that's all I've got for now. Oh, I was going to mention, uh, you said you had five on your line. A lot of the rural lines back in the late 50s were up to 10 on the line. What we, uh, a lot of ours were stopped at 8, but there were some with 10 also. That's all. Uh, Save the rest for later. <laughs> we had two, two in our party when I was growing up. I didn't realize that until my sister told me that. Does anybody else want to come up and share anything? Yes. Thank you. I'm Larry McDevitt. Um, a lot of the stories we're familiar with are first of all was a prank on it and stuff. But what I really wanted to talk about was uh, my military service towards the end of my time in Germany. I was stationed in Rouen. I ran a Mars radio station. And we would make phone calls. Louder, please. Uh, Mars radio station. Okay. Uh, Mars radio station. We had a small room in a building. And we had a two-way radio. And we would pick up, we'd try to call military um, places in the United States. If we picked up like in South Carolina or wherever it would, it would come in, then we would call, you would come into the office, write your name down and the phone number, and we'd get on the, our phone or on the radio and call them, and then they would do a collect call to that person. And once they got them on the line, then they could talk, but we had to run the switches. So if you would say, hi, mom, how are you doing? You'd have to say, over. And then we click it, and then we can talk back and forth. So there's a little learning curve with everybody coming in, but it was just an interesting way to get phone calls. And the only charge was uh, uh, to collect calls to the people that were talking. So, but it's just an interesting time. And our party line had 10 people. We play records on it and do things <laughs> like that too. That, that's all I had. Thanks. Okay, yes, we should. Okay, do you want to stand up if you're a former operator? We can do a count or. Oh, Madonna, you are here. I did not see you come in. Okay, so we have, um, oh gosh, Melt, Madonna Fegan in the back, and Carolyn Moorhead, and Norma Modit, and Mary Jo Crouch. Melt. And Milton, yes, and Milton. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This was a lot of fun for me putting this one together and just trying to remember all of the, all of the ladies. That was really awesome. If we could, say yourself. If we could, we would like to take, Don would like to take a picture of all our former telephone operators that are here, if we could do that. And then maybe take a picture of Norma upstairs in this putting into the switchboard where she worked for so long. And I was going to ask her, I've been told that, and I've seen some records saying that the Clinton engine switchboard during a certain time that they were in operation was the busiest switchboard in the entire Midwest, the switchboard right up here that Norma operated for a long time. That's, that's saying quite a lot, I think. Thank you, Sue Mayer. That was awesome. Hi, Yeah, it was. So we can use that snowbag.